All right. So I've just turned on the recording of the session so that uh, there will be uh, others who can listen to it uh, at a time that's convenient to them. We're just going to pray, and then we will uh, get started with our time of uh, discussion, questions, interaction, and so on. So uh, let's pray. And uh, maybe I can ask uh, Abraham, would you like to please pray? OK, Pastor. OK. All right, please, let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to be in your presence again. Father, our hearts are open, our minds are open to hear your word, Father. Father, we ask that whatever word that will be shared today, Father, will teach us your word, will guide us into the way that we should go. Father, we pray for all the faculties today, even as they are going to share with us, Father. You give them the right or trust to answer our questions. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abraham. All right, welcome everyone once again uh, to this mentoring hour. Uh, we're just going to leave it open. Uh, anyone is uh, welcome to ask any question or uh, to bring up, um, you know, anything you would like to discuss um, about our Christian life, ministry, the Word of God. Uh, experiences uh, you're just welcome to ask uh, any questions and uh, we have our, uh, our faculty available here to lead us um, Paul would you want to lead the discussion today would you be available to do that uh, yes pastor but uh, okay. pastor, my camera has a little bit of an issue so oh, I see that's yes, okay yeah anyway um, you can uh, still lead the discussions so okay we'll, we'll all be here so I'll hand it off to you, Paul. You could uh, lead the discussion, and all of us are here uh, to participate. Take over, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. OK, uh, good morning once again, everyone. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, John, for the question. Uh, John's posted a question here. In Colossians 1.24, Paul writes, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. We know that Christ's death was the fully sufficient payment for our sin. So what did Paul mean when he said that something in Christ's afflictions was still lacking? Okay, uh, so uh, could one of us please uh, try and answer this question. Uh, Yeah, John, um, that's uh, that's a good question. Now, if you just look at the context of uh, Paul's writing in Colossians chapter one, uh, you know, and then in verse, I think it's verse twenty-eight, he really explains about his ministry. He says, you know, him be preach, warning every man, uh, and teaching every man, uh, striving according to his power that works in us mightily. All right, Colossians one verse twenty-eight. I think. Let me just turn there. Um, so, uh, yeah, 28 and 29, right? So uh, how do we understand what Paul is saying? So one, uh, Christ's work on the cross is a completed work, right? Nobody can add to that. But that completed work, the message has to be taken to people. That is a work Jesus could not do and did not do. And in the process of taking that message to people, Paul the Apostle and all of us today are uh, endure afflictions or endure suffering. So that is what Paul is referring to. The suffering that he endured, that he went through, in order to take the message of the finished work of Christ on the cross 
to people in his day and his time. So that's what Paul is saying. I am filling up in my body what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. What does that mean? When Christ died, he died to save the world. But this part of taking that message to people, he did not do. He left that responsibility to the church, to us believers. So that's what he's referring to. That is, uh, Paul and he details this in Second Corinthians chapter eleven. You know, he just gives a high uh, an overview of all the sufferings that he endured, simply to take the message of Jesus to people in his day and his time. And that's what he's talking about, right? And it's also, um, you know, uh, uh, reiterated there in Colossians one twenty eight and twenty nine, when he says, you know, uh, we strive according, we work, uh, and we labor, and we strive. For this you know, to present every man perfect in Christ but in order to do that he endured suffering so uh, that's the suffering that he's filling up in his own body yeah. is that okay okay thank you Paul you can take uh, thank you John uh, uh, anybody else anybody else would like to uh, add any other point to this question Uh, so, yes, uh, feel free to post in your questions. Uh, it could be even uh, any thoughts that you may be having uh, with regards to um, anything that you've been learning also. Uh, so feel free to please post in any questions that, or you can even unmute and ask your questions, please. Okay, Charles has posted a question. Um, Leviticus 17 and verse 11, uh, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Uh, what does this mean? Okay, uh, yes, so uh, could any one of us, uh, I'm not really sure of this, but could any one of us uh, please take up this question? Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Charles, for the question. And uh, Paul, I'll try to answer. Um, so uh, uh, here in this uh, verse, uh, Charles, what we see is that, you know, God, um, uh, I mean, we don't understand why, but uh, like he reveals to us that uh, the blood uh, is very important to um, atone the sins of uh, uh, people. Okay, so that is what is being put forth here in the book of Leviticus. Uh, and, uh, you know, we know that uh, uh, in the temple, God had instituted these practices where, where uh, the people of God would go and they would uh, sacrifice animals uh, and their blood would atone for the sins of the people. But uh, we also understand that whatever happened, what God had asked uh, uh, his people to do in uh, in the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament, those were actually shadows of the things that were to come later. So we know uh, in the book of Hebrews, we read about the Lord Jesus, who uh, who is the fulfillment of these uh, shadows, right? So he became that perfect sacrifice and his blood uh, is that uh, uh, atoning, uh, is, his blood bought us that final atonement. Okay, because he became that ultimate lamb of God. So uh, I just wanted to share uh, this much. I think maybe Pastor can add to this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. So Charles, you know, we can look at it um, like this, right? Uh, we know the wages of sin is death. That means the price that has to be paid for sin is death. Now, how do we know death has occurred? We know death has occurred when blood is shed. 
because the life is in the blood. So, for example, if you go back to the very to, to the to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, what does God do? He brings them the um, uh, so they cover themselves with the fig leaves, the leaves of the tree. But God brings uh, the what do you call it? The skin of an animal as a covering for them. Indicating to us that blood was shed to provide this covering. Right? So just going back to the original thought, the wages of sin is death. The way we know death has occurred is when blood is shed because life is in the blood. Therefore, the blood is what makes atonement for the soul, the blood. Because the blood represents a life that has been given as a, result, as a payment for that sin. So the word atonement simply means to make at one. That means it's a reconciliation. So sin divides or separates us from God. Atonement puts us back with God. It makes us at one with God. But for atonement to happen, blood has to be offered because blood represents that Death has taken place, and the, for, to satisfy the wages of sin, wages of sin is death. Right, and then you can understand everything uh, that Pastor Nancy just shared. That you know, the Old Testament there was the blood of the animals, but the blood of the perfect Lamb of God is what makes the ultimate atonement. So that's why blood is so important from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Even in Revelation, Jesus is known as the Lamb of God. The blood is very important because it represents the price that is paid um, for sin. Is that okay, Charles? Thank you, Pastors. Okay, Paul, you can. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, we have another question from uh, Jeffina. It says that read Hebrews this morning, and I don't understand Hebrews 6, 7. Uh, could you please explain it? Okay, I'll just post the verse here, Hebrews 6, 7. Uh, so it says, Hebrews 6, 7, for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. Okay, uh, I'll just try and uh, just put in a point there and then I'll leave it open to other uh, faculty as well. Uh, so the writer here is just uh, bringing an illustration of, uh, uh, of, 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 of uh, being fruitful. So we see that when the earth, uh, for example, the land receives rain, um, it should bear fruit. Uh, now, when it uh, uh, when the rain comes, the purpose of the land is to bear fruit. Now, uh, the the writer here is trying to say, uh, we all have been blessed, but even as we are blessed, uh, it is important to also remember to bear fruit. And uh, uh, and and even in the book of Matthew, it says that uh, we shall be known by our fruit. Uh, so. Uh, just a point on this, uh, that an illustration where uh, when when God has placed us in a place, it's uh, as the Lord blesses us, rain uh, is uh, can be, uh, you know, uh, interpreted as a blessing. So uh, when rain comes, when blessings come, it should also be important that uh, uh, we bear fruit during these times of rain. So, uh, yes, that's what I'd like to share. If anybody else, uh, please go ahead and. Add a few yeah, um, thanks, Paul. Just wanted to share uh, the context of um, you know Hebrews six. If you if you see, actually, it starts uh, that line of thought uh, starts from chapter five and uh, you know verse twelve onwards, where uh, the writer of Hebrews is exhorting the believer, um, and he's saying you know uh, you've had 
time you ought by this time you ought to be teachers but then again you need someone to teach you the basic principles and then he goes on to saying you know um uh, well, uh, someone who's unskilled uh, in the word of righteousness, partakes only of milk, and and so on. And so he's really talking about uh, you know moving from immaturity to maturity, moving from um, uh, to a life of, uh, of fruitfulness, like just uh, Pastor Paul just shared. And then he goes on to say in chapter six, verse one, you know, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, let's go on to perfection. And um, and 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 then he, he and then he goes on to talk about. Uh, you know, in, in verse four, um, about those who are enlightened or those who have tasted the heavenly gift and become partakers of Christ, you know, if they, uh, and tasted the good word of God, if they fall away to renew them again, you know, we experienced all this. And then if they make a choice to, uh, or make some poor choices because of which they walk away, uh, you know, reject, then it's uh, very difficult to, you know, renew them back. And then he shares this uh, illustration uh, because um, uh, illustration about rain coming on the earth and how a person who's cultivating the land is expecting uh, herbs that are useful but if it's going to be bearing only thorns and briars you know if the life is not productive is after receiving all this then it is um, rejected and whose end is actually uh, to be burned, you know. So he's uh, drawing a parallel between a land that is not um, yielding, is despite all the uh, everything that is receiving, and he's talking about uh, you know people who have uh, experienced God, experienced salvation, experienced the good word, and so on, and uh, they reject. And then if you go on to see verse nine, he says we are confident of better things concerning you, right? Uh, things that accompany salvation. So it's it's a warning and it's also an encouragement, and he uses this as an illustration um, to talk about moving from um, you know immaturity to maturity and to go on progress in their spiritual lives thank you thank you pastor uh, pastor would you like to add anything pastor uh, sounds good i think uh, pastor jake's uh, uh, um, jake kumar covered it yeah right. good good yeah, thank you pastor uh, uh, we have another question here from WhatsApp, which is, can you share some practical tips to reach out to a backslidden or a lukewarm believer? Okay. Uh, thank you, WhatsApp, for that question. Uh, I'll just give in a few points. Uh, uh, yes, we've been studying this in lifestyle evangelism as well. Um, so uh, we've been focusing, uh, uh, like especially while sharing the gospel, we looked at uh, the importance of, uh, you know, sharing the message of the cross. We looked at Romans, uh, where uh, Romans says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God unto salvation. So yes, there are different methods, uh, the five-minute cross gospel two-minute message uh, where we can share our testimony or pray for uh, people's needs so some of the practical ways is uh, firstly uh, personally one of the things that i do is i keep in touch with them uh, on a continual basis uh, either through phone or email keep in touch with them uh, and then continue to give the word because uh, I believe that the word itself will, you know, uh, penetrate into their hearts and uh, really make a change. So, uh, so just keep giving the word. Uh, continue to, you know, uh, follow up after that. Uh, you know, you can probably send them a verse uh, from the Bible and then, you know, maybe uh, call them, message them, meet with them, and you ask them, uh, what is it that you, uh, you know, understand from this? Is it something that uh, you would like to discuss? So initially, they may not, uh, you know, some of them may have different uh, you know, responses. Some may say, okay, um, uh, why don't we discuss? Some may not be willing to discuss. Uh, but once again, uh, like what we've been studying uh, in uh, lifestyle evangelism is remember that the message of the cross is powerful and is, uh, and is able to, you know, touch people's lives and change people's lives. So that's just one practice tip that I'd like to give. Uh, yes, anybody else, any other faculty can add points, please. Uh, 
Yeah, just um, thank you, Paul. That was, that was good. Uh, just to add to what uh, Pastor Paul shared, um, you know, just to, uh, um, uh, this is just from a perspective, understanding uh, the condition of a backslidden or a lukewarm believer. And in Revelation 3, uh, when you look at the church in Laodicea, this is Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Uh, you know, it's the last, the seventh church that Jesus talks about. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, this is a, um, a backslidden church. And Jesus himself says that, you know, you're lukewarm. Um, but what caused them to be lukewarm? And it's just a nice thing to just examine that. I'll just very quickly summarize it. Um, one of it, uh, the, the thing that we see here is in verse 17, they are saying, I've become rich. I've become wealthy. I, uh, I don't need anything, right? So uh, they've come into this place where they feel like, look, uh, I've got everything. Now, the, he's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. He's saying, you know, you've come into this place where I am rich. You're saying I'm rich, I'm wealthy. I, I don't need anything. But instead, he says, you don't know you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I mean, this is what you think, but this is your real condition. So one is, uh, there is, you know, what to be, but uh, if you want to use a very strong word, um, it, there is self-deception, right? They think they are like this, but they're really this. You know, they think they are wealthy, um, rich, wealthy, and need nothing. But Jesus is saying, you don't know. You are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind. Now, uh, um, so what does he offer as a solution, Right. There is, uh, in verse 18 and 19, he says, I want you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, right? Uh, so that you can be rich. Meaning, I want you to buy what is, uh, I don't want to make this a long sermon here, <laughs> uh, but very quickly, um, I want you to pay the price. So how do you buy from God? You know, how can you, you can't send money up to heaven. But what he's talking about is we paying the price here on earth in order to pursue what is of eternal value, gold, uh, which is refined in fire, so that you can actually be rich, right? True riches, but you pay the price for it. Second, white garments, that is righteousness that comes from God, right? And third is uh, uh, anointing for your eyes, revelation for your eyes, so that you can see. And uh, then verse 19, he says, I do rebuke those who love, whom I love. So essentially we are saying, God, so how do we pray for them? God, open their eyes, anoint, open their eyes. God, I pray that you'll help them see, you know, the, the, where they are, that the self-deception they may be in, open their eyes, help them to see, help them to pay the price for what is, sometimes people backslide because they're unwilling to pay the price. Uh, for what is of eternal value, help them to pay the price. So this kind of just gives us some insight on how to pray for those who might be lukewarm. Just want to bring our attention to that. Thank you, Paul. I'll hand it back to you. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Uh, right. Uh, we have another question from uh, Diana Tulur. Uh, when a non-Christian is ready to accept Jesus, ready to say the sinner's prayer, yet is not ready to give up the customs and rituals of his or her current religion, what does one say to them? Okay, uh, would any of us like to uh, answer that question? Can I share? Yes, Charles. Um, Go ahead, John. I believe uh, that a person who is ready to say the sinner's prayer and is not ready to leave the other parts that he has been living in, I will go ahead and guide him in saying the sinner's prayer. And uh, I don't remember where the verse is that it is God who works in you, who wills in you, who will also do. So I lead the person to salvation and then leave the, the growth to him to 
God because he who has uh, watered the heart to be tender enough to say the sinner's prayer will also guide the person. Maybe it will be me, maybe it will be another person, maybe I have planted. Then there is someone who is going to water and slowly by slowly, step by step, those things that he used, he trusted, will be removed and he will put his life completely in the Lord Jesus. That would be my approach. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Charles. Uh, so uh, just a, a brief summary of what Charles uh, said is that uh, uh, just like how Paul writes to Corinthians and he says one sow the seed, uh, another one waters it. So it, there will be times when uh, we may have to, uh, you know, wait and give the person some time to, uh, you know, come out of all uh, uh, these rituals that he or she has been involved in earlier on. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for those verses. Uh, right. Now, anybody else would like to add a few points to this? Uh, somebody has already said the sinner's prayer, yet not ready to uh, give up their customs and religions, so, uh, customs and rituals. So what can we say to them? I'm sure there are people around us. Uh, practically, what can we say to them? I think one thing we can uh, probably do is in, engage in conversation and uh, and and find out why they are doing this. You know, I've heard of uh, a person who used to um, like uh, do the rosary, you know, um, because uh, it was very very close to his heart, and the whole uh, idea of mother, you know, being very emotionally close to his heart and so on. So he was he used to do that uh, many years uh, or many months, sorry, after becoming a believer. And uh, and so, uh, but one day he had the revelation that um, about you know salvation uh, by faith through grace and the freedom that we have and so on. And and then he kind of stopped doing it. But um, but also uh, his friends actually engaged in conversation to really ask you know why why he would do that. I remember you know I used to wear a cross on my neck. I, I have nothing against people wearing crosses, but uh, but somebody really asked me you know um, because that was becoming. Um, a, a kind of a, a religious thing for me, uh, and somebody asked me, you know, why do you do that? And that re that really set me thinking. And uh, so, so like that, you know, it depends on what is that ritual, and you can, you know, you can ask, you know, why, and uh, and share from the word, you know, that we've been set free from. Uh, scripture talks about how we've been set free from the empty ways of our forefathers, and uh, we've been released into the freedom that we have in Christ, right? So, um, and. Yeah, people will see the value of it and let go of it themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, thank you, Paul. I just want to add to uh, uh, what uh, Pastor Jake said. Uh, um, so uh, engaging people in a conversation, uh, that helps. Uh, and I uh, am reminded of um, uh, sharing the truth of God's word because uh, I think uh, many a time we, we continue to do the things that we do because we believe you know, that is the right thing. But uh, uh, we see in scripture the way, uh, you know, uh, in the early church, uh, the apostles, they went and preached the word uh, and uh, people got saved. But even after that, uh, they would teach from the word of God, the way of living, uh, the way of worship to the people. So when uh, the word is taught, that brings a transformation. And uh, uh, yes, of course, there could be a, um, there, there could, um, it may not happen immediately, but uh, uh, the whole point is that, uh, you know, uh, making people obedient to the word of God, uh, and, and which is what the apostles were doing by teaching uh, God's word. So I am just reminded of that, the importance of teaching the word, teaching from the word as to why uh, something is okay or something is not okay. Uh, and then, yes, you know, the person um, uh, is able to renew their minds according to the word of God and then also transform the way uh, they, they live. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, yes, I would like to add just one point. Uh, uh, Romans 12, 2 uh, talks about uh, 
don't be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. So yes, the, we accept the Lord in a moment. Uh, so the spirit is becomes a new person. But then the renewing of the mind uh, is something that happens day after day. Even we as believers keep renewing our mind day after day. And, and so, uh, uh, so Paul is writing to a, 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 a Gentile church. They're all believers. They've accepted the Lord uh, as their personal savior. Yet he's writing to them and saying, uh, do not be conformed to his word, be transformed by the renewing of, your, of their mind. So, um, so yes, it's important uh, to you know, uh, give them the word and let them know uh, that we have to uh, you know, transform our ways, not conform to this world by the renewing of our mind. Thank you uh, for that question. Any other questions? Um, thank you, Diana. Thank you. Yes, feel free to post in any of your questions. Maybe it's something that uh, we are studying in class as well. Uh, Divya. Divya has posted a question. First uh, Corinthians fourteen four. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. When one prays in tongue, in private, how can that be understood? Uh, good question. Thank you, Divya. Uh, yes, I'll leave it open to our faculty to answer uh, this, please. Pastor, uh, would you like to take up this? Pastor, Pastor you're on mute, Pastor. Oh, okay. No, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm sure others can answer yeah. this. I'm just waiting for somebody to jump in. Eugene, why don't you take it up? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so, uh, Divya, um, it's, it's talking about two spiritual gifts over here. One is uh, speaking in tongues, and the other one is prophecy. So um, what Paul is saying here is anyone who speaks, uh, speaking in tongues uh, is a spiritual gift that uh, is given to edify oneself. And he also talks about it in the chapter where um, if, uh, you know, when, when the church does speak in tongues, there should be someone to interpret it so that uh, it, it could be, uh, it could also be edifying to those who aren't believers. Whereas the one who prophecies um, can do so in church because it brings about the edification of the, um, uh, the, the community, the, the church, the, the entire congregation. So um, the edification, uh, speaking in tongues is mainly for a personal edification and uh, prophesying is for the edification of, um, of, 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 a, of a congregation. Yeah, I think that's that's a point that I could put by. Thank you. Um, just to add to what uh, Jean shared, um, so th there are a couple of things here. Yeah? Like one is, uh, uh, of course, uh, you're praying in tongues for personal edification. So um, uh, here, Paul is also here referring to um, something that is uh, done in a congregational setting, right? Uh, tongues. If it if there is a message in tongues. And if it is done in a congregational setting, suppose you know somebody goes up in front and prays out in tongues or speaks in tongues, then uh, obviously there has to be an interpretation, which is also one of the uh, gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. There's an uh, interpretation of tongues. So, so we can pray in tongues uh, and give a message in tongues, and that can also be interpreted and whether where we have the where the holy spirit uh, interprets that message so uh, paul is saying that you know uh, if i pray in tongue uh, and I, if i do that then um uh, verse 4 uh, then i'm personally uh, you know uh, i'm being edified but when i'm prophesying 
uh, I'm obviously, uh, you know, speaking to the church, a message to the church, then um, the message, uh, the church is getting edified. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, Paul himself uh, says that, uh, you know, um, um, he who speaks in a tongue, you know, uh, when I pray in a tongue, I don't understand it myself. So we can pray and ask for edification, even for ourselves, but right? even for our personal use, uh, we can pray and ask for uh, interpretation. And uh, definitely when we go forward and uh, there is a message in tongues, um, the same can be done so that the church receives edification. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastors. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, anybody else would like to uh, add on to that point or we can move to the next question? Okay, we, uh, Avni has a question. Uh, how should we, how should a believer understand or pray and prepare for persecution that we hear about in nations that is rising? How should a believer understand or pray and prepare for the persecution that we hear about in the nations that is right. Yes. Uh, so could anyone, one of us just add some points to this question, please? Um, maybe I'll just share a little thought uh, here, then others could at least add to it. Um, uh, I mean, we can read Hebrews 13, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. Hebrews 13, verse 3. Somebody could read that. Yes. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3 says, Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Amen. Okay. So, um, uh, the writer of Hebrews is uh, encouraging us as believers uh, to be mindful of uh, those who are suffering, right? Whether they're in prison or they're being mistreated, he says, be mindful of them. Now, uh, practically, and I'm just speaking practically, um, practically, this can be actually uh, quite overwhelming and quite emotionally uh hard you know especially if you keep receiving a lot of persecution news uh you know and uh, uh, i'm not belittling, belittling uh, the suffering that that believers are having in different parts of the world but you know i'm just talking about as, a, as an individual you know uh there are organizations that focus in on uh, persecution and so they have the newsletters or WhatsApp messages, all that going on. And I used to be on one of these groups and every day there'll be like these things. And then I just left the group. I couldn't emotionally handle it personally because, you know, there will be all these pictures and all these things. And so I couldn't handle it. I'm just speaking practically. So because it's overwhelming and also it's emotionally very, you know, uh, uh, it affects you emotionally when you when you keep getting a lot of this, uh, be, and this is happening worldwide. So, what I would say is this: you know, how do you live out Hebrews thirteen three practically without being crippled? You know, otherwise this whole thing coming it coming at you can actually cripple a believer. They can be it can be so overwhelming. So I think the the real thing is this: you know, do what God has graced you to do in this area. So I know of ministers and ministries who are focusing on this. That is, that is this, you know, quote unquote speciality. And as they focus on it, they, their whole organization is focused on persecution and helping people who are persecuted. And they can do it uh, because they're graced by God to do that. That's their calling. They, that's what they, so I don't have to try to be like them, you know, uh, I have to focus on what God has graced and called me to do, which is, you know, to minister his word and those those kinds of things. But in that process, to the extent that God enables me, I will practice Hebrews 13.3, which is to serve people who 
uh, either imprisoned or mistreated, that is persecuted for their faith. So we must always remember we are not the savior of the world, Jesus is. Each one has to do the part God has called us to do. So to the extent that I can help and uh, to the extent that God has graced me in this area, I will do it. So really what we are doing is so practically this is what we do is to take care of our own pastors so that uh, first, you know, so that when any of them are persecuted, we step in, you know, to back them up and, you know, help them out. And then to whatever extent, you know, if there's anything more, you do it. Uh, so I'm just sharing this because uh, it can be a very overwhelming area. And sometimes, you know, there is this whole thought process of maybe I'm not doing enough. And so we get pulled into doing something that God may not have graced us to do or called us to do. Right. So uh, the Bible instructs us, Hebrews 13, 3 and um, in other places, you know, to pray for them, to support them. But do what God has graced you to do in this area without being overwhelmed, uh, because you need to do the things that you've been primarily called to do. That's just my uh, a few practical side. Others can please feel free to share. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, yes. Anybody else would like to add uh, any points? Uh, any of our faculty? Uh, so uh, I just wanted to add one uh, point here. Um, uh, the Lord Jesus in John 15, he, he 18 onwards, he he says that in this world. Uh, you will have persecution. So uh, it's not something new. Uh, it has been happening from the time uh, the church was birthed. Uh, so yes, as believers, we are to pray. We are to ask God to um, give us boldness uh, uh, to, you know, to face the persecutions. That we praise God that up to now we haven't uh, faced that much of persecution. But uh, but. Uh, I'm reminded of this other verse as well in uh, uh, John 16, th uh, 33, he says, uh, but take heart, I have overcome this world. So one of the things that we can do is uh, take refuge in the word of God during uh, times of persecution. Thank you, Avni. Hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, Isaac, yes. thank you. Uh, Isaac, Wendy, um, it's about the cause of praise and worship. Uh, Yes, praise and worship is the first year's uh, class. Uh, I'm not really sure why you're not able to access the class. Okay. Uh, I was just looking at the code. I think uh, Isaac is entered in 023, whereas the code is uh, the letter O. It starts with the O, alphabet O, O2354 VK. So maybe uh, it's that, Isaac. Um, Pastor, is that uh, yeah. right? I, mean, I was just checking the code on the schedule. So it says uh, O two three. I don't know if there's anything apart from that. So um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's uh, the first word, first character is uh, O as an orange. Okay. So uh, yes, thank you, uh, Isaac. Please uh, just uh, make a note of that change instead of zero. Uh, the number zero. The first one is the alphabet O. Oh, okay, we have a question from Herbert. Uh, is there any effort I can do in order to speak in tongues uh, and more, uh, like Pastor Jakes and others and more? Uh, uh, Pastor Jakes, maybe you can answer this question. Uh, is there any effort I can do in order to speak in tongues? Um, well, um... Yeah, thanks, sir. But uh, uh, so the, uh, the tongues is actually a gift from, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit, and um, the only uh, uh, only qualification is that a person 
being a believer and uh, receiving, praying and receiving because uh, Jesus is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. And uh, the only qualification required is to pray and uh, believe. But um, of course, I just want to direct you to, um, you know, uh, the book which Pastor has written, Pastor has written um, on praying in tongues, which is available at um, uh, at the link, uh, apcwo.org slash books. You can check out that title. And it has a lot of practical things. Um, uh, I'll just speak, I'll just you know, uh, share a little bit. Uh, one of the things if for a person to begin to start praying in tongues, one of the things could be uh, certain mental blocks, you know, uh, like uh, maybe I'm worthless, maybe I have to become holy in order to be used by the Holy Spirit or to receive anything from the Holy Spirit. So, um, so that is the thing. But we need to understand that the Holy Spirit, He was, uh, you know, given to us or He's come to take residence in our heart in order to lead us uh, to you know, uh, Christ-likeness, in order to put to death the deeds of the body. You know, we put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit of God, as we read in Romans. So um, so that is one thing that he has come to uh, to help us walk that path towards Christ-likeness. So, um, so it's not your degree of holiness which is going to enable you to, you know, pray. Then the other thing for us to understand is that we, we can only you know, pray him. Uh, he gives us the words, like he inspires the words, but we speak it out. So sometimes we are we are thinking that, okay, God, you know, you will you will open my mouth, you will uh, make me speak, and and we are not really, you know, cooperating in any way. You know, so it is us, it is we who will who speak out. Uh, that is for us to understand, and also for us to know that uh, you know we can only speak two languages. I mean, one language at a time. Right? Sometimes we are, you know, we're just praising God and saying praise the Lord, Hallelujah, and just worshiping, and in that language, in your in the language that you know. And, uh, but then, um, you know, uh, we just need to, uh, we, we need to understand that we can speak only one language. So we need to quieten down and then um, pray uh, uh, the words that uh, the Holy Spirit puts in your heart. Um, and also it, it, what is helpful is to understand that, uh, hey, uh, just think of it in terms of sounds. You know, what is uh, what are these syllables? What are these words? These are sounds. And uh, many times we hold back because it doesn't make sense. Because for us, uh, you know, um, as human beings, like we want something to make sense in order to be able to speak it out. So, um, so think of it as sounds, you know, syllables, words, these are, these are sounds. So uh, maybe you, you know, you feel like, releasing that sound right there is a sense in your spirit to release a sound in a certain way and um, and the next time you know you pray and ask the spirit you you pray out or you speak out uh, that syllable that the spirit is putting in your heart and uh, and speak it out in faith and speak it out loud and bold that you can hear it yourself and i'm sure pretty soon you'll be uh, you know the spirit of god will lead you to uh, pray out in tongues thank you Thank you, Pastor. Um, would any of our other faculty would like to add to this? Uh, we just have a few minutes left. Uh, uh, maybe we can take one last question, a small question. Uh, just have two minutes or a minute left. Okay. okay. Uh, my, my name is about Avin's question. Even when he was when he was asking about uh, the preparation, we see like in Afghanistan, uh, we see so many countries are uh, really uh, persecuting the church. So those practical things, maybe in this season, do, do we see like there is a move when the Bible is going to be removed? Like nowadays, people are using the the digital Bibles, maybe the Bible will be banned digitally, and now physical Bibles will be not allowed, things like that, so that we are ready for persecution. That's the angle of me, I was looking at it. Oh. Okay, oh. Yo, uh, Charles, I, I couldn't really get that because there's a lot of jarring to that question on your mm -hmm. end. I think he was, um, yeah, what Charles was asking was um, because of what we are seeing happening globally in different parts of the world, um, uh, is there a possibility that uh, we will lose the Bible? That means, you know, people are moving to digital Bibles and would it be that uh, digital Bibles would be banned and physical Bibles be banned? Um, 
uh, as uh, Sir Charles was asking that question. Um, uh, Charles, this is just my opinion. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, uh, what to say, uh, backed by any study or research or anything. I, my personal opinion is, uh, well, yeah, persecution will increase. Um, uh, evil will increase as we progress closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. Uh, but I don't think we're going to be in a state where, um, you know, we will not have the Bible. That I just think there are too many Bibles around, <laughs> uh, both in print and digitally, for anyone to be able to wipe it out. Uh, uh, so I, I don't think we'll reach that state. Uh, uh, you know, Bibles are just everywhere. Uh, but it is true that uh, there is increased persecution, and, and Jesus spoke about it as well. You know, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, Paul wrote about it, uh, you know, in Second Timothy. He said, you know, people be hateful and so on. He just describes uh, the moral condition of man. They'll be haters of truth and so on. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, anybody can eliminate the word of God at this point. Yeah, just my opinion. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, uh, uh, we finished our time. Uh, so thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, I want to encourage each of us to also encourage your classmates to uh, be part of these mentoring hours. Uh, let's just close in prayer. Could one of us please close in prayer? Divya, can you uh, please close in prayer? Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity that you have opened us for us, Lord, to to be mentored, Lord, uh, to be uh, taught in your ways, Father, Lord, even as, Lord, the desire of our hearts, Father, is to know you more, Father, uh, to have a greater personal relationship with you, Father, Lord. I pray that you uh, grant us, Father, Lord, the uh, a heart of surrender, the heart of obedience, the, uh, the will that is completely surrendered to you, Father. Our hearts align to your will, Father Lord. We bless each and every pastor, Father Lord, who, who are investing, who are pouring into our uh, lives, Father Lord. Uh, we bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. I uh, also pray for each and every student, Father Lord. Thank you and praise you, Father, for each one of their lives, Father. Thank you that you call them blessed. They are precious in your sight, Father Lord. Bless them immensely. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll see you in the classes. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jan. Thank you.